the Zero Hour. Now, this year marks the 100th anniversary of Einstein's theory of general relativity. It is the 100th anniversary, unless you've been traveling close to the speed of light for the last 100 years. And here to talk about Einstein with us now is returning to the show for the second time. We're delighted to have him back. John Horgan is a science writer. He is at times a hockey player. He blogs for Scientific American. He's a teacher at Stevens Institute of Technology, and he's the author of four books, including The End of Science and The End of War. John, thanks for coming back on the show. It's nice to be back. Well, it's always great to have you, and I really enjoyed this piece you wrote uh, on why there will never be another Einstein. Now, even now, I guess it's been, what, 50 years or more since Einstein's death. I don't remember the year of his death. Uh, He's still an iconic figure. Everyone knows who he is. His name is part of the general vocabulary. Uh, what was it about Einstein that made him such a critical uh, cultural as well as scientific figure, you think? Well, first of all, there are his unique qualities of um, <clears throat> being not only a, a, a brilliant scientist with a really profound imagination combined with prodigious technical skills, but he also was this he was a wise person. He was somebody who was morally prescient. He recognized that racism was wrong uh, much earlier than most people did, well before the civil rights movement. And he also took a strong stance against war when that really took a lot of courage. Uh, he was uh, philosophically deep. Uh, he had a spiritual uh, side to his nature, even though he wasn't religious in um, in any conventional sense and certainly didn't believe in in the god of Judaism or or um, Christianity but what most people don't realize is that he also came along at the perfect time uh for achieving great things particularly in um, in physics at the early 20th century so the old Newtonian framework for understanding the physical world was already beginning to crumble toward the end of the 19th century. And uh, Einstein came along and saw the flaws with the old way of looking at time and space and matter and energy and came up with these profound insights into how nature works that I don't think will ever be transcended. Well, you know, I've learned only enough about Einstein's theories to realize from a dimly from a distance how incredibly beautiful they are for one thing how how beautifully thought out imagined constructed how perfect they seem in light of a real world uh, verifiable uh, uh, results Uh, but I also have this image of Einstein and this is Getting a little nerdy here for our audience, but 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 we'll go with it. Uh, sure. I, I also have this image of Einstein as a revolutionary whose revolution went places he didn't want to go. And in 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 other words, I'm thinking of his reaction to uh, quantum physics and that sort of thing. Where you know, here was a guy who really did, as you say, upend Newtonian physics and really cause us to think about the nature of the universe, structure of the universe in, in, in extremely different and, for lack of a better word, uh, more fluid ways. Um, and yet along came these other people who said things that, uh, while scientifically re- verifiable, uh, he just couldn't tolerate. Right. Well, so, for example, it, if you go back to 1905, Einstein was quite young. He was uh, totally unknown at that point, and he wrote a series of papers, any one of which would have made him a great scientist, a, a, a titanic figure. He wrote one paper on the uh, on the photoelectric effect, um, which is a property of certain materials where they are are bombarded with light and they emit uh, um, electrons. And it was very puzzling to physicists at the time. And he showed that it could be understood in, in terms of this strange idea that uh, went back to a German physicist named, named Planck, in which 
uh, energy comes in little packages called quanta. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was the beginning of the quantum revolution. And then Niels Bohr and others ran away with this idea of, uh, of Einstein's, and quantum mechanics was born. And, and uh, Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics because it was so counterintuitive. It was so bizarre in what it said about cause and effect um, that he, he, he really had a problem with it. He thought that it had to lead to some more sensible deeper theory. But here's part of what Einstein's genius is. He wrote several papers, especially one that he wrote with um, with two guys named uh, Podolsky and Rosen, pointing out that quantum mechanics was just illogical. It just didn't make any sense in terms of conventional causality. And he showed how bizarre it was and how this couldn't possibly be right. And that paper led to experiments that confirmed quantum mechanics confirmed the weirdness. So even in this, and you could call it, let's say, a mistake in his refusal to quantum mecha- to accept quantum mechanics, he helped to reveal the, the depth of the paradoxes uh, within quantum mechanics. Even when Einstein was, was, uh, was making mistakes, he was doing work that uh, that showed his genius. That's one of the things that I love about his career. Well, there's there's an old uh, I think there's an Elvis Costello song called "Brilliant Mistake." So uh, we're talking with science writer John Horgan about uh, Albert Einstein on the occasion. What, 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 do you remember the publication date actually of the of the theory of general relativity? It, it, I'm sorry, I don't. My my uh, my history is not that fine grained. But it was 1905. We know that. Uh, well, 1915 for general relativity. 1905. I'm sorry, 1915. Right, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for general relativity. But the theory of special relativity, which laid the groundwork for general relativity, that was another one of the papers that he published in what's co- sometimes called the miraculous year of Einstein's life in uh, in 1905. And and you know uh, in 1905 at least I don't think he 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 had an academic position I think he was strictly um, working as a patent clerk or in Zurich yes. or something so he didn't even he was not up to that point stellar enough uh, in his uh, academic performance to warrant an uh, an appointment somewhere I guess yes huh? and and there's some people who who think that it was because Einstein was sort of an outsider that he saw problems in really unusual, fresh, creative ways, and he might not have seen them if he had already had a position in a physics department at a major university at that point. Uh, And um, who knows? It's really fun to play with those ideas. I I just want to address one question that comes up um, when you're talking about Einstein, whether or not he, he just was this towering genius with an IQ off the charts mm-hmm. that can never be replicated, there are there, there's actually an, uh, an idea that I agree with, which is that one reason we don't have have Einsteins, these towering geniuses uh, today, is because there are so many Einsteins. There are so many scientists who have uh, huge IQs, who have staggering technical skills in mathematics and uh, physics. And because of that, it's harder for anyone to stand out from the pack. This can um, also apply to other fields of, um, of creative endeavor, both in the arts and in, in, uh, in the sciences. But the crucial part, the missing part uh, of that for understanding why Einstein is still such a towering figure is that physics today is um, it's diminished because Einstein and other pioneers of uh, modern uh, post-Newtonian physics have already come up with the great principles and it's getting harder and harder to transcend that. Basically, modern physicists are just kind of cleaning up 
after Einstein and Bohr and Schrodinger and Heisenberg and people like that. Well, you know, I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit, John Horgan, the science writer, uh, because you've talked about the end of science and the idea that maybe the great discoveries have been made. And uh, you make a compelling case, but I just have this mental image that uh, uh, of this being one of the repeated laments throughout, well, Newton has come and gone, and now we know the mechanics of the universe. There, is n- there are no more great discoveries to be made now, uh, or going back, uh, I- I- you know, even earlier than that, that uh, or later, that there aren't there periodically moments in the history of science where people just say, okay, well, that's it, we've figured everything out in science field A or science field B, we'll just be cleaning up uh, from here on in, and then another revolution happens. Well, uh, there was a slight sense of that toward the 19th century, because when I was I was writing The End of Science, working on it, I uh, constantly heard this um, rebuttal uh, response that... Um, Oh, people have always thought that science was ending, and it, and of course it uh, never ended. And supposedly, uh, that was a rampant idea at the end of the 19th century. But actually, at the end of the 19th century, there were a few older physicists who were complaining that maybe there weren't any great discoveries left. But meanwhile, there's tremendous excitement over the discovery of uh, X-rays and uh, radioactivity. And uh, there were all these questions about the, whether there was this ether that pervades right. space. So there was actually quite a bit of tumult. Uh, but the, the argument I try to make is that if you believe that science actually is getting a grip on reality, is uh, discovering reality instead of just sort of making it up in some kind of postmodern sense, then you have to accept that at some point it reaches an era of diminishing returns in the same way that as we explore the earth eventually we get to the point where there are no continents left or great oceans left to discover we reach an era of diminishing returns and i think that that actually applies to our discovery of the great principles and laws underpinning the uh, the physical and biological realms well, it's an interesting thought. And, and to close off on Einstein, okay, so, so you raised the question, could there be another Einstein? You, in your uh, addendum to your piece, uh, you quote the physicist Brian Greene on the subject, saying, yes, there, are, there have been other geniuses, but uh, uh, the, as a thrilling example of what the human mind can accomplish, well, that question speaks to us, to what we as a civilization will deem precious. In other words, suggesting, I would say that Einstein is kind of a social construct. Everybody created the Einstein we know, not just Einstein and his work, but a culture that venerated that kind of work and maybe venerated the the, the hair and the, the air of peacefulness and wisdom and uh, pacifism and what he stood for in terms of values. Maybe we don't, maybe uh, this kind of war-torn and uh, uh, acquisitive world we live in now wouldn't really want another Einstein. Well, I I think there's some truth to what you just said and to what Brian Greene wrote at the end of uh, the, the quote I had at the end of my uh, piece. But science is also diminished. There aren't great prominent scientists who are coming forward and questioning Uh, U.S. military policy Mm -hmm. and uh, the connections of science to the defense industry in the way that that, uh, Einstein did and that the great Nobel laureate and chemist Linus Pauling did, or even that in the way that Carl Sagan, the great astronomer, did uh, a few decades ago. Scientists are very career-oriented now. And uh, and I do think that the era of great discovery has... uh, has also uh, passed to a great extent. So it's not just the fault of the public and the culture. It's something within science itself that has led to this kind of diminished reputation. Well, that's a fascinating point. And by the way, the figure who would be perfect to do that is Stephen Hawking. So come on, Hawking man, we're 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 waiting for you. Um, <laughs> uh, so John Horgan, science writer, author of The End of Science and The End of War. As always, great pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, RJ. Talk to you later. You bet.